1775, Thomas Paine wrote a pamphlet stating that the freedoms of men can only be maintained by limiting the power of government. The pamphlet was called Common Sense, and today it still is Common Sense. I'm Leanne Senek. I'm Mark Zakaria. This is Common Sense. Welcome back. I'd also like to introduce Leanne Senek to our news desk rotation. Leanne is a lifelong resident of Woonsocket, where she is remembered for her critically acclaimed radio program on WNRI, Take a Stand. Leanne, welcome to Common Sense. Thanks, Mark. I'm excited to be here. As we are to have you. Ladies and gentlemen, we also hope you are excited to be here. Stay tuned to hear how the protests over the Burlville power plant are now spreading to surrounding cities and towns. You will also hear how widespread prejudices against a minority segment of the American population are adversely impacting the message of democracy this year. And what would an episode of Common Sense be without the latest on truck tolling and the tortured progress of roadworks? So hang on for all of that. As usual, we have an extended interview for you this week. After our analysis of the news, I will be taking you to the campus of Bryant University in Smithfield to check in with Gary Sass. He's the founding director of the Hassenfeld Institute for Public Leadership and a longtime student of the operation of Ocean State government agencies. We'll talk with him about everything from term limits to corporate welfare. In between segments of that detailed briefing, Leanne and I will pop back in to take a satirical look at the political scene as we ask our favorite trick question, are you kidding me? Finally, Portsmouth's pundit Jeff Richard will bring the program home with his special brand of commentary. This week, he casts his jeweler's eye on the bond questions on November's ballot. So, let's get this program started with that promised analysis of some of the top news stories impacting Rhode Islanders today. Leanne? Thanks, Mark. Let's start in my home city of Woonsocket. Last week, the growing drama over the proposed Invenergy power plant in Boroughville spilled over into our fair city. Chicago-based Invenergy has been working all year to get the permits it needs to begin construction on a 900-megawatt gas-fired power plant. That effort has brought increasing waves of public protest on a number of different related issues. The use of open space for industrial development was one. Then there was the use of natural gas to fuel the generator. That was said to be a problem since it promoted hydraulic fracturing as a, a method to mine the gas. Finally, the big sticking point seemed to be that the local water system in Barville did not have the capacity to supply the plant's needs for cooling water. This controversy arrived in one socket when the protesters' organization, Barville Against Spectra Expansion, or BASE, turned out for a meeting of our city council. There it became apparent that the administration of Mayor Lisa Baldelli Hunt was in talks with Invenergy to supply the needed water to the proposed facility. The actual details of the talks between the energy company and the city had been discussed with city council members in executive session and could not be made public. Just the suggestion, however, was enough to trigger a relitigation of the entire proposal and protest. It turns out that the Barville site is a natural for this development because it sits at the confluence of two major natural gas pipelines and within easy reach of another. That means fuel would be plentiful and available at the best price based on the three potential sources. Whatever you think about fracking, it is being done and it has made energy, America energy independent again. The gas is presently flowing through those pipelines and someone is going to use 100% of it. So the argument against promoting the process seems to have been an afterthought. Everyone needs electrical energy. Even the most devoted of the base protesters wants to be able to recharge his or her cell phone and cook dinner whenever they please. Neither solar nor wind power generating systems could even come close to matching the 24-7, 900 megawatt output of the proposed gas-fired plant at anything like its size, cost, or reliability. As for one socket, Lord knows we could use the income. So this battle is being fought on a philosophical rather than ecological or economic basis. Folks, it looks like you can stand by for some heat and light from the base protesters in one socket, at least until the water question is resolved but it won't be the kind of heat and light they can use to recharge all those cell phones. Mark? Thanks, Leanne. Everybody loves to hate the rich. Political satirist P.J. O'Rourke's best-selling book on political economics was entitled Eat the Rich. O'Rourke's work in that volume was as acerbic and on point as any of his other tongue-in-cheek reviews of foreign policy, the operation of Congress, or the worldview of America. This one 
outsold the others by a huge margin, though. Why was that? Well, the title, of course, we like to hate on nameless, faceless cartoon caricatures of wealthy Americans whose only known characteristic is their mega money. The left is currently trying to popularize a new battle cry to tax the 1%. Even the most rudimentary arithmetic shows that taking 100% of the incomes of the Warren Buffetts, Bill and Melinda Gateses, and Barbara Streisands of our nation wouldn't begin to put a dent in the government's annual operating deficit. So it's not about paying for federal largesse, it's about payback. How dare they be rich? Enter Donald J. Trump and his now legendary 1996 New Jersey State tax return. It appears Trump claimed a little more than $900 million in business losses that year. That was all the Clinton campaign needed to gleefully go into righteous indignation mode and spin that as a scoundrel's attempt to avoid paying what he owed. Look, if I'd lost half that, it wouldn't matter what I owed. I'd have been unable to pay a nickel because my piggy bank would have been vaporized by the catastrophe that led to the shortfall in the first place but the Clinton charges gaining traction for exactly the same reason Eat the Rich is such an effective title. Do you now, or have you ever had dependent children living in your home? Ha! And during that time, did you or did you not take the standard deduction for those dependent children when filing your federal income taxes? Ha ha! So, you took every deduction that was available to you under our 70,000 page tax code. Okay then why is it a microaggression when someone does the same thing, only with much bigger numbers? Remember, no one is accusing Mr. Trump of any impropriety, much less any criminal act. Nope. But because we love to cackle over celebrity picadillos, Mrs. Clinton can run the table on news cycles with this meaningless tidbit, thus avoiding any attention at all to her record as a cornerstone of the Obama administration. Donald Trump's legal tax filing may be an eloquent argument for starting over again with our federal tax code. In fact, that overhaul is way overdue. On the other hand, Hillary Clinton's use of this non-issue as a red flag to divert attention from her own more substantive political problems is strong proof that presidential campaigns are matters of art, not science. Do you get it? She's playing our instinctive desire for payback to get the cover she needs to run out the clock. Hey, that's being straightforward with your constituents. Leanne? Thanks again, Mark. Late last week, Patrick Anderson, writing in the Providence Journal, reported on the progress of Rhode Island's initiative to toll trucks on federal highways. He indicated that the U.S. Federal Highway Administration had executed memoranda of understanding for 13 of the 14 proposed toll gantry locations, and that the last one would be forthcoming when routine environmental concerns surrounding the location were addressed. That action by the federal government paves the way for letting contracts and beginning construction on the electronic infrastructure to implement Governor Raimondo's tolling plan. According to Patrick Anderson, Rhode Island DOT plans to issue requests for proposal for the gantries this November. The General Assembly authorized the administration to commence truck tolling last February. It was a controversial vote and one which came remarkably early in the legislative session. House Speaker Nicholas Mattiello was said to be eager to get this particular vote out of the way so memory of it may fade before the start of the election season. In a press release issued to coincide with the announcement of these agreements with the feds, Governor Gina Raimondo was quoted <clears throat> as saying, For too long, our state kicked the can down the road on infrastructure, allowing our roads and bridges to crumble and fall into disrepair, unquote. In my humble opinion, her use of the term kicking the can means that previous dedicated income streams, which were intended for infrastructure maintenance, have been diverted instead to the general fund where they've disappeared. I refer, of course, to the gasoline tax, the gasoline tax increase, DMV, fee, DMV fees for vehicle registration, and the recent 300% increase in those DMV fees. That income totals far more than the $45 million per year that's estimated to come from truck tolls. So what makes you believe for one second that any of this new revenue stream will actually go to fixing roads or bridges? I'll tell you what will happen. There will be a lawsuit filed by the American Trucking Association on the same day the first truck toll is assessed. Chris Maxwell, executive director of the Rhode Island Trucking Association, is already working with his counterparts at national headquarters to make that action ready. 
since the gantries will already be in place with operating contracts in force when the courts invalidate differential tolling. Guess what happens next? The state will toll us all. If we ever do get to that point, please don't say that common sense never told you so. What can you do now to derail this project? Why, vote in the election just 24 days from today. Vote for state legislative candidates who are committed to repealing truck tolling and using available existing funds to start the road work long before 2018, which is the earliest any toll revenue will come in. Mark? Thanks, Leanne. Folks, before we move on to the first segment of my extended interview with Gary Sass, watch out. I'm pretty sure someone is about to ask the question, are you kidding me? One day, 10 years ago, Michelle Obama had a flash of insight about the quality of her daughter's diets. Are you kidding me? At the time, the girls were American tweens. What quality do you think they had in their diets? Instead, what the future First Lady recognized was that Sasha and Malia subsisted on a blizzard of McDonald's burgers, Starbucks coffee, Hardee's chicken, and, well, DQ blizzards. Mrs. Obama and her daughters were more urbanites who ate out more often than in. At that time, they had just taken up part-time residence in Washington, D.C., as then-Senator Obama had recently been sworn in. To her credit, directly after this dietary epiphany, Michelle decided the family would start growing its own vegetables. Fast forward to the White House, where the new First Lady supplemented an existing herb garden by adding 1,100 square feet of newly tilled green garden for those all-important veggies. She made the girls help out with everything from tilling to weeding to harvesting to cooking to eating the homegrown produce. During the Obama's White House years, the First Lady's garden grew to some 2,400 square feet in size and served up arugula, cilantro, tomatillo, hot peppers, spinach, chard, collards, black kale, berries, and lettuce. That's not to mention the honey produced by the beehive she had installed for pollination. Fast forward to the light at the end of the tunnel. Now it seems Michelle Obama is trying to institutionalize her veggie patch so that it doesn't go the way of Eleanor Roosevelt's victory garden once the new tenants move in. But will she be successful? Well, if the Clintons make a return engagement, she might not be able to put anything over on them since they've seen it all before. Although, with Bubba now taking the role of first laddie, Mrs. Obama may be able to sell him on the idea of raising potatoes in the garden to provide himself with some stealth french fries. If it's the Trump family, though, Michelle might succeed with a disinformation campaign to convince the new president that the White House kitchen garden grows only the most amazing produce. But do you think Melania will drag Barron out to till and sow in his business suit? Are you kidding me? I'm Mark Zakaria. This is Common Sense. Welcome. This is the program where we try to make sense out of the policies that affect your life and come up with common sense solutions. And I'm thrilled today to be on the campus of Bryant University in the Hassenfeld Center for Public Leadership with its founding director, Gary Sass. Gary, thank you very much for taking time with us. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Well, uh, it's, it's going to be great for our viewers to hear some of what's going on in your world right now. And uh, as I understand it, uh, I, I'd like to um, uh, start by, uh, by, by asking a little bit about term limits. I know that that's a hot topic for you these days. And if you can just briefly uh, summarize, and then we can get into some of the details. OK, well, in the state of Rhode Island, we already have term limits for the general offices. The governor, the general treasurer, the attorney general, the secretary of state are limited to two terms. We don't have any kind of term limits for the members of the legislature. And in many ways, the legislature is the strongest branch of state government. It writes the laws, it exercises oversight, it approves appointments to the governor's cabinet. Uh, and so there are two types of term limits to think about when you think about the legislature. One is a term limit on the number of terms a person can get elected to the legislature. And another is a limit on the number of terms a person can serve in a leadership position. So, and so we, we looked very closely <coughs> at that issue and came to the conclusion uh, that trying to get term limits, limiting the number of terms a member could serve, uh, would be very difficult. It would require a constitutional change, and the probability is very high that the leadership would never ever put that on the ballot. And second, there are pros and cons on, on term limits for membership. You know, some of the cons are 
uh, that lobbyists get stronger, you know, staff get stronger at the expense of our elected representatives. So we think that's an issue that needs further study. But as far as term limits for the leadership are concerned, and when I talk about term limits for the leadership, I'm talking about the speaker, I'm talking about the Senate president, speaking about majority and minority leaders, and, and chairman of committees. Holding those leadership offices, not necessarily holding a seat in the chamber. Right. They, if there's no term, no limit on the number of terms they can serve, that's, they, they'll serve as, as, uh, as much as the people in their district want them to. But <clears throat> in terms of serving in leadership positions, there's no limitation. And we know this, that the, the, Rhode Island has one of the most centralized uh, leadership regimens in, in the country of any legislature. So the leaders are, are making the rules, the leaders are doing committee assignments, uh, the leaders uh, discipline members. You remember on the toll vote there were three or four people that didn't vote with the speaker? And yeah. you know, they were history the next day and as far as their committee assignments were concerned. And we don't vote for the speaker, we don't vote for the Senate President. Mm -hmm. We vote for members of the legislature. And yet there's, there's no limit on terms. So it's very possible to gerrymander a district and someone could get elected to serve in a leader position as long as they wanted to. And it creates, uh, I think, uh, potential abuses of power. We, we've seen uh, scandals in the uh, legislature. The uh, former speaker in his federal prison, uh, the chairman of the House Finance Committee, uh, resigned in, in disgrace. So there's an arrogance of power. There's not any direct you know, public oversight. And so what we're suggesting is for a number of reasons that we limit the number of terms a person can serve in a leadership position to six years. Now that shouldn't be very disruptive because we went back and looked at what the average tenure was of House, of House speakers and it was only to seven years. So a six-year limit on terms is not going to be this great disruptive thing but it'll have a number of positive advantages. Let me just ask one quick question. Uh, let's go right to the nuts and bolts of how you do that. I mean, if the leadership makes all the rules and you're asking them to make a rule that they don't see is in their uh, best interests, um, who's got a big enough stick to make that happen? Well, I, I think uh, we have to use the bully pulpit. Uh, there are 12 states in the country uh, that limit the terms of leadership, how long they can serve in leadership position. Uh, some is done by statute some is by custom and some is by rules. And I think <coughs> the, the arrogance of power of the legislature is, is pretty clear. You know, whether it was ethical issues, whether it was tolls, you know, people are dissatisfied uh, with how decisions are made. People are very dissatisfied with the ability to, to have their representatives effectively represent their, their points of view. So it's a, it's a political issue. It's very difficult. You fight an uphill battle. Uh, but I've gotten a call since we put this out from several people in the legislature about how can we work to change the rules? How can we start this, this conversation? And so, like anything else, uh, you know, when you challenge the status quo, particularly uh, in, a, in a state where one party is so strong, it's not easy. But <coughs> it's, it's, it's building a coalition. It's electing people who are interested. It's, it takes time. But there are really dividends to the people from doing that. First of all, <coughs> go to an average member of the legislature and say, who are you representing? Are you representing your constituents or are you representing the speaker? And I'm not sure what the answer would be. Uh, so the benefits you know, from this kind of approach, it encourages innovation and new thinking. There are a lot of very good people that serve in the Rhode Island legislature. But so what you're suggesting is that we propose it to existing leadership as the best half measure that they can get to look like they're moving forward but without having to give up all of their uh, well, and I, and authority. I, and I think if, you, if you're you honest about it, you do need a strong leadership system in a legislative body. Just imagine if every member of the legislature, all 113, were free agents. Uh, we'd have a political tower of Babel. Uh, we, it needs to be disciplined. We're seeing some of the problems in the United States Congress right now. I was just right going to say, I, yeah. I close my eyes and I see the Congress of the United yeah, States. So, so I'm not, it's not a question of trying to weaken leadership. It's a question of building a legislative system. I'm not weakening leadership, but you are asking them to give something away. Well, we're asking them to give something away that encourages new thinking, mm -hmm. encourages innovation, uh, enables representatives and senators to be more representative of their, their constituents. Uh, we're saying involve the backbenches more in setting the legislative agenda. Uh, <coughs> we're saying these kind of limitations on amassing power uh, will limit the abuse of power. You know, Lord Acton's famous statement, uh, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Well, look around. And then we're also talking about parity. The, le the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate in Rhode Island are as influential uh, as a governor. 
Some would argue more so. Uh, well, the governor's term limited. Mm. These ladies and gentlemen are not term limited, so there's a question of balance. So I think there are a lot of reasons for more representative, more responsive, more small d, you know, democratic government uh, by putting a term limit on. Because the power of, of the Speaker of the House, power of the Senate President, you know, compared to their peers in other places, it, it is, is significant. Mm. Uh, and, and I think this is a way to, to open the process up. Do you think that your fallback position there is to go to a constitutional amendment if you have to? Well, I said this is, I, I, I don't know about that because uh, putting a limit on a leadership position means that you've got to go back and look in the Constitution and make sure that those positions are actually in the Constitution, which I'm not, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure they are. Might not be. You know, I led an effort at, uh, a couple of years ago to have a constitutional convention. Uh, it was turned down, you know, big, big labor, big democratic forces. Big status quo. S so, yeah, refused to support it. So it's much more difficult in some ways to amend the Constitution. In other ways, if you create a public uh, uproar or concern, then the legislature can put a constitutional question on a ballot. But I'm willing, because I don't think we have all the answers, uh, to put uh, term limits on leadership positions and, and give some flexibility. If they don't work, then you change the rule. Gary, we just have a few seconds left. Uh, how do you rate your chances? What do you think the odds are that uh, this can happen? Well, it's going to take a lot of education, you know, a, a lot of work. It's going to take electing people to the legislature to have this conversation with you. Uh, so it's going to be difficult, but the next scandal may be behind the corner, and so we'll find out. Gary, I thank you very, very much. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, please stand by because this is the first of just of four segments of time that we're going to have with Gary Sass here today. But right now, take a break because I believe someone is going to ask the satiric question, are you kidding me? Campaign managers frequently tell their candidates things that those unfamiliar with the electoral process would find strange. Well, those unfamiliar with the American electoral process probably find the whole thing strange. Are you kidding me? My point is that last week, the campaign manager working with GOP candidate Steve Frias repeated an old axiom of that dark art. The best day of your campaign is the day your opponent goes negative on you. If that's true, then the best day of Steve Frias' campaign was really outstanding, judging by just how hard and how deep his opponent turned negative. Steve's opponent, by the way, is current House Speaker Nicholas Mattiello. For all the power and authority that that's at the Speaker's command, he still does have to win re-election in, in order to continue in his role as Rhode Island's most powerful Paul. All Steve Frias has to do to unseat Tsar Nicholas I is to notch around 2,000 votes. Mattiello must regard his hold on the seat as fragile. Next thing you know, former Democrat Chair Bill Lynch issues a press release accusing Frias of using the revolving door because he served a term as an appointed member of Rhode Island's Public Utility Commission and now wants to be a state representative. Huh? Bill Lynch is a heavyweight contender in the hierarchy of Ocean State Democrats, but now he's speaking for Nick Mattiello, the guy who got the governor to take on ex-rep Don Lally within only a few weeks of his departure from elected office? Now that was a revolving door violation. Sorry, Bill, your objection is overruled. The revolving door doesn't turn in reverse. So what's next? What's really going on here is that Speaker Mattiello is using some of his massive campaign fund to do internal polling of his district, and he's not liking what those results are telling him. Careful, Nick. The voters can sense panic, and they don't like it. Are you kidding me? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Mark Zakaria. This is Common Sense. Welcome back. Thanks for sticking with us. As you know, we have today our interview with Gary Sass the founding director of the Hassenfeld Institute of Public Leadership. We're here on the campus of Bryant uh, University talking to Gary. And Gary, before we proceed, please just give us a quick summary of what the Hassenfeld Institute is and does. Okay, the Hassenfeld Institute, uh, you know, came about through the generosity of the Hassenfeld Family Foundation. And its mission in a very simply stated phrase is to work with state and local officials, both elected and, and unelected, to help them develop the tools and skills they need to be effective leaders. Excellent. That's Excellent. It. And uh, what we've been talking about so far indicates that effective leadership wouldn't be a bad thing to have a little more of. Uh, in this segment, we'd like to talk a bit about state finances, and it's a pretty broad subject, of course, it, not just the annual budget, but also pension funds, uh, post-employment benefits, uh, bonding discipline, and there are others. You are obviously very critically interested in all of them and had your hands in all of them when you were the uh, chief administration uh, for the state. Uh, would you talk a little bit about what the primary financial problem is facing the state today? 
Well, it's <laughs> it's too much spending and too little revenue. <laughs> you know, you can put it in simple terms. You've, you've asked a, a very broad question, so let's start out generally with state finances and the state, the state budget. The principal problem with the state budget is we never balance it. Mm -hmm. The budget that was enacted by the Assembly just a few months ago, uh, back, in, back in June, uh, has a structural deficit. Uh, about $123 million used to balance that budget comes from the previous year's fund balance. And, and so we, we never get into structural balance. You know where we have where current revenues equal current expenditures, and you know that is okay in good times. But as soon as the economy goes bad, the budget crisis is, is, comes up. So the first thing to do is to really adopt a truly balanced budget, which we haven't done for years. Well, we have a balanced budget statement in the state constitution, it, and you know, the, well, so the, the budget is balanced. But when I talk about structural balance, as a fiscal conservative, it's having a budget where I spend as much as I take in from current revenue. And if I have reserves, I, I could use those. I, I understand that. And the point that I was trying to make was that uh, over and over again, we see leadership in the House and sometimes in the administration um, um, accepting wildly uh, out of line uh, estimates because it all adds up to balance. Everyone can say we have a balanced budget. And then the next day, you know, it's like the Treasurer saying we're going to make 7.5% on the pension fund. I don't think Warren Buffett could do that. No, no, and we'll, and we'll come to that, to, to, the pen, to the pension fund. The method they use to project revenue is not all that bad. They have a revenue estimating conference. They develop a consensus number. Uh, and the consensus number is a, is, a, is a reasonable estimate, but they, it's a question of not getting control on spending. So the first issue is a lack of structural balance. If you look at what that means, and you look in the out years, because the budget is, is more than one year, it's, it's, it's out years as well, uh, there are out year deficits next year, in, in the years in starting this July, uh, we have a deficit of about $200 million, and so that's about 5% of spending. If you program it out to f uh, fiscal 21, uh, which is July of, uh, uh, of 20, uh, the deficit grows to almost 9% of budget, it grows to over $330 million. And so what and that and results from a very simple reason. If you if you look at the average projected growth uh, in revenues, it's about two six two point six two point seven percent, and the average annual projected growth in spending is about four percent. So that is simply as you can define as a problem. And what that means, uh, and why out year yeah, deficits are important, and and why structural balance is important. You're right. You mentioned earlier that constitutionally we can't have we have to have a balanced budget, but if you're constantly fighting the battle of closing deficits, closing out year deficits, not having structural balance, then you can't make decisions to grow the economy of the state. You can't make decisions on, 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 on tax policy to reduce tax burdens. Uh, you can't make the decisions to invest you know, money, uh, you know, whether it's in infrastructure or, or whether it's in uh, uh, <coughs> other, you know, other, other areas. And so we're, the state, the revenue situation, the budgetary situation, the state effectively keeps us in neutral. It's not that big a deficit that you can't paper over it each year, but it's not. But it's it's, it's like a cold. You, you're never healthy enough to do what you need to do, and and that you know in, in a lot of ways is is is, is a major challenge at the state. What I'm hearing from what you're saying is that the folks up on Smith Hill understand the problem. They're Very just well. ignoring it. They're just making believe it isn't there. Well, they understand the problem. I, I think they understand it very well. And they're being responsive uh, to pressures from various interest groups. And that, that's, that's a, a big, big part of the problem. They really need to you know, sit back and, and you know, almost say, we should adopt a budget where the growth in revenue and the growth in spending are in parity. And so if you look out five years and you're projecting revenues to grow about 2.5% a year, and spending to grow by 4% a year, you're always making bad decisions. And no, no one, whether it's a business or a smaller government or this university, can make good decisions with that kind of uh, structure. So the short answer is the state has to spend less. It has to control the rate of growth in spending, right? And it has to adjust priorities. And a, and a good example, you, you talk about you know, some of the issues, and I'll get into one of my favorite subjects, is Obamacare. So we rush to expand Medicaid coverage under Obamacare. And the federal government says, don't worry about it. The feds are going to pay 100%. Well, in a year or so, we have to pay 10%. And so we have this ballooning area of expenditure. And, and now 10% comes online because of the, uh, of the state share. And so we have to think of those things you know, ahead of time. Uh, you mentioned pensions. Uh, I don't know how much time we have, but, but the, the pension 
you know, issue is, it really happened in three cycles. First cycle is uh, Governor, uh, Tre at that time, Treasurer Armando came in and said, something's wrong with this pension system. And she does some very useful work, and we find out that the rates of return are unrealistic, the mortality rates are unrealistic, and she adjusts it. And as a result of the adjustment, the unfunded liability uh, goes way up goes up by almost $2, $2, $2 billion, I think. Uh, <clears throat> second step is we go through and we adopt pension reforms, some very needed reforms. We have a hybrid deferred benefit, deferred uh, compensation plan. Uh, we've frozen COLAs, uh, changed uh, eligibility ages. So uh, we reformed some of the, uh, the provisions of the plan. Third area is what causes concern. Uh, <clears throat> we do crony hedge fund investments. Uh, I, I was reading somewhere uh, that our hedge fund growth since 2011, the rate of return on hedge funds has been about 4.7 percent. If I had just invested in the S&P Standard Poor's 500 index, it would be closer to 15 percent. Uh, and, and so what does that mean? It means a couple of things. It means we have realistic projections on what the growth is in return of investment. Uh, we've made bad investment decisions uh, by using uh, hedge funds, and I want to commend uh, the general treasurer for pulling back on that. I don't know what took him so long to get there. I was there. say finally. But yeah, he, but he did get to get there, so better late than never. Uh, and and, and what will happen now is we've already gone to the employees. We've gotten them, we've negotiated uh, reductions in, in their benefits. And now we're finding out that <laughs> the assumptions on rate of return on investment, 7.5% a year, which you, you mentioned earlier, Warren Buffett, you know, could, couldn't achieve, uh, you know, using hedge funds, just getting away from simple indexation, are causing a hole. So what happens then is if the unfunded liability, you know, goes back up, it comes to taxpayers. And one example, if we, I'm sorry, Jim. Oh, just briefly, I, we're coming to the end of our segment, and uh, what I, I have to say is that what we've proven here, if nothing else, is that we could do an entire interview on this subject. Yeah. For now, however, I am going to have to cut it short because time is the uh, ruler of a, of a TV show, and someone is about to step in and ask our satiric question again, are you kidding me? A week ago Friday, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse held the annual constituents conference he calls the Rhode Island Energy and Environmental Leaders Day. As an outside observer, it appeared to me that the day was a cacophony of ever more shrill voices dis disagreeing with one another, but ultimately conceding just one point. Everything we are doing to deliver energy today is wrong. And everything we are not doing to deliver energy, mostly because of extreme costs and doubtful claims of effectiveness, we should still try to do. Are you kidding me? <laughs> As usual, the gathering was a who's who of green activists. Writer and cult philosopher Bill McKibben Skyped in an eight-minute greeting that both praised and castigated his host, Senator Whitehouse. Greg Garrett of ProsperityForRI.com praised the senator for his weekly diatribes on clean energy from the floor of the U.S. Senate. Garrett went on to say, however, that the resistance, those engaged in frontline battles against fossil fuel infrastructure, was ultimately going to have a greater effect than the carbon tax that White House champions. It would be easy to highlight the Lewis Carroll absurdities which abounded at the meeting and just play the whole thing for comedy as a parliament of naifs. There was some real missing logic, though, that no one pointed out, much less bothered to correct. For instance, the two, and only two acceptably clean forms of electrical generation were repeatedly said to be solar photovoltaic and wind. No mention was made that the majority of the juice on the ocean state grid is currently hydroelectric, courtesy of Hydro-Quebec. Similarly, everyone avoided the question of what to do with spent solar panels after their roughly 10-year life cycle. They are, after all, loaded with selenium, a toxic heavy metal. <laughs> sure, that's clean. McKibben himself apologized for once favoring the transition from coal to natural gas as a positive step in controlling greenhouse emissions. Disapproving critics in the audience seemed unwilling to forgive him for that egregious breach. Senator Whitehouse's proposal for a carbon tax and carbon credit system in America has as much chance of passing the U.S. Congress as Mr. Garrett's windmills do of making electricity on a calm day. 
or of anyone's solar panels making any on any night of your choice. So in the end, what happened at this annual street fair for aspirations was what always happens. Nothing. Are you kidding me? I'm Mark Zakaria. This is Common Sense. Welcome back. We're still talking here with Gary Sass, talking about the things that he does is as the director of the Hassenfeld Institute for Public Leadership. We just got done with a very interesting uh, review, uh, compressed but interesting, on um, public finances. And now the subject that we'd like to talk about is corporate welfare. Gary, would you start by just explaining to our viewers what you mean by the term corporate welfare? welfare. Well, well, corporate welfare is using tax dollars, you are my tax dollars, uh, for specific businesses. So corporate welfare exists when tax dollars are used to finance preferential tax deals for, for a company, uh, to give company direct cash subsidies uh, or, or loans for a specific business. And we have a long history of that, of course. Um, probably one of the more recent is 38 Studios, uh, and there have been some since then. So can you give us a couple of examples, and then let's talk about what can be done about it. Yeah, well, you know, one example uh, it was A.T. Cross. A.T. Cross recently got almost a $2 million you know, grant from the state because they threatened to move outside the state. What people forget is that A.T. Cross is no longer the iconic company where you have Rhode Island is sitting at benches making some of the best pens in the world. It's a back office operation. Uh, and that's, that's one example. Another example is in the, media, in the press this week. Uh, there's a group called Urban Smart Growth. They got uh, $3.6 million in tax credits. And there are people uh, who now are pointing out that the uh, person that's behind that was a slumlord. Uh, you know, we, we've given a big tax credit uh, to Homewood Suite Hotels. I think it's a great hotel. You know, I have no reason not to think it's a great hotel, but is that a priority? Why should I be using tax dollars to fund the building of another hotel? The, the market's important. market determines these things. And there are a lot of different examples that I could give, but uh, yeah, 38 Studios is a good jumping off place to begin this, this conversation. Uh, one of the biggest initiatives uh, that this governor and the General Assembly took was a massive expansion of the corporate welfare agency that gave us 38 studios. They converted the old Economic Development uh, Commission into uh, Commerce RI. They rebranded it as Commerce RI, and they gave it <coughs> a tremendous uh, uh, you know, uh, monies and powers to exercise corporate welfare. Uh, in effect, then they're saying the state should pick winners and losers. Now, in fairness to the state, and I always want to point this out, Rhode Island is not an island. There are other 49 states. So you can't ignore the fact that other states are trying to entice business to invest and, and come. So you need some of these kinds of instruments. And I would argue, you, this is a, a point that others may not agree with, uh, that the uh, corporate welfare we're giving General Electric to come here is probably a good investment. The corporate welfare that we're giving a hotel or UG, US, USG, or some of the other things are make make no economic sense at all. So that has to be you know put into the, to the to the to the right uh, context. Uh, but <clears throat> the way we've been exercising and and, and, and taking corporate welfare, uh, largely through real estate credits, tax increment tax increment financing, tax stabilization agreements, went back and I looked, and this is a little bit out of date, but it's the best data I have. For the first 18 months of the existence of Commerce RI which is really the old EDC on steroids. It, 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 we, our policy is we're going to buy economic development, and you're not going to buy it this way because we're not very good. Government's not very good at picking winners and losers. But I went back and I looked, and, and there were 92 projects that were given some kind of grants or loans or, or tax subsidies in the first 18 months of operation. Almost 60% of that money was to subsidize real estate tax deals. Economic development is not real estate. Economic development is, is, is much broader. And that, I think, should be a cause of, of, of concern because those dollars, and even though some are one-time dollars that came about as re refinancing, uh, could have been used to strengthen education. Uh, they could have been used to uh, reduce taxes for all of us, to create a better business climate. Uh, it's amazing that, and, and we, we say, Rhode Island in every business climate or tax climate ranking is what I call in the ter terrible 10. We're in the, we're in the bottom 10. Uh, the latest that came out recently from the Tax Foundation, or Business Tax Climate, had us 44th. 
Uh, it's 44th largely because of how we treat unemployment insurance, and, and the governor and legislature made some reforms in that this session, so we'll see how that works out. But it's also 44th because we have very high property taxes. And so now we're giving <coughs> crony deals to some real estate developers, some you and I would probably agree with, others we would, 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 would disagree with, and we're ignoring the biggest problem that a developer has or a manufacturer has of high property taxes, which mean higher rents and uh, less ability uh, to, to compete. So I guess it's, a, it's a, you know, really a fundamental philosophical issue of what is government's appropriate role. And if it's corporate welfare, you run the risk of cronyism, you run the risk of uh, giving um, grants and using public money uh, for, for you know, companies or f that, that you know or you have it, you know, a, a, think politically have an interest in or something. And so that's the cause of concern. Uh, I would, you know, argue that y your point about the, about the government picking winners and losers is very well taken and probably should be emphasized. Um, I, I used to know a scientist who had a sign in his office that said the, um, the laws of physics will be strictly enforced. And uh, <laughs> I have always argued that the laws of economics are also strictly enforced. And, and you, you can't... Um, um, by force of will, make a winner because the laws of economics will be strictly enforced. There's probably no documentation, you tell me, on most of these decisions, whether it was a crony deal or not. Oh, I can tell you about documentation. Okay. No, because we study this, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in Rhode Island. Uh, in the state of New Jersey, uh, <coughs> Metropolitan got, I think it was Michelle, got $200 million of tax credits for moving three blocks in Newark. Uh, uh, Panasonic got hundred million dollars in tax credits by moving one train station. And so politicians, you know, use public money uh, for private investment. And, you know, while you can't be blind to how the world really works, the question here on corporate welfare is, are we overdoing it? Well, yeah, and I think and we are overdoing it, but, okay, Panasonic got a goodie from New Jersey, but, and Sharp didn't. Is that because somebody on the inside likes one over the other? You know, there, there may not be real documentation that that's the cause and effect, but you always have that suspicion. And the suspicion is this. A company is going to expand, invest, and, and relocate if it makes economic sense for the company. Uh, if the market's good, if there's a skilled labor force, those are the things that determine it. And as you do more and more studies, and this was done recently by the New York State Tax Commission, uh, these companies are going to expand anyhow. They, 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 the tax credit that they get is not a substitute for the market, for the, what makes economic sense to the company, for the availability of labor. So sometimes we're giving out these tax credits when we really don't have to. Yeah, and and uh, we don't necessarily have the, um, the the poker face to know or be able to play that game when we don't have to. I, uh, I think yeah. it, it's our first <laughs> reflex is to say, here's some money. Yeah, it's, it's really a really a basic question, and it's a philosophical question of what is government's you know you know proper role in enticing companies to come and expand the state. And government does have a role to play, but it but it's it's not just by real estate deals. So how can we tighten that up? I mean, is this a thing where if media could shine more light on it and you could know about it beforehand, maybe only the better decisions would would get through? Well, I think the first way to start tightening it up is for the legislature to do their job <laughs> and have some hearings on this when the. Uh, Commerce RI was created. Uh, the legislature gave that agency, you know, considerable latitude. They gave them some more latitude in this last session of the legislature. Uh, and I think they have to sit back, they have to represent the people's interest to say, what are we getting for the tens of millions of dollars that we're giving out to individual corporations? And without oversight, then you really don't know. And, and I, this can be monitored and studied like anything else. There's no will on the part of the administration to do that because this is their baby. Your comment is telling. If the legislature did its job for the people. Uh, right now, we have to call a, an end to this segment because the clock is running. We will take time out for one more Are You Kidding Me segment and then be back to conclude things with Gary Sass. There's a romantic notion that the election season is a magical time when Americans come together to jointly determine their own futures in a delicate dance of democracy. Are you kidding me? Hey, there's a reason the final days of the election cycle are known as the silly season. This is a time when mature adults become children again, despite the best efforts of their party committees and campaign managers. Here's a case in point. There's an epidemic of boycotts going around Rhode Island right now. 
It started when then Governor Lincoln Chafee directed his staff to boycott WPRO radio so as not to have anything embarrassing come out about this administration. Uh, how'd that work out? Next, the House Democrats got mad at a couple of the WPRO talk show hosts and decided they could boycott the station too. Naturally, Republicans were all in favor of that move since it left them with all the earned media from that station. It turns out that the D boycott is still in place this cycle, sort of. A few of them sneak on with Gene Valicenti now and then, but that's way too early for Dem Chair Joe McNamara to be awake to catch them at it. Now it seems that there's another boycott by Democrats. This time it's at a candidate's forum in Portsmouth, organized by the Concerned Taxpayers of Portsmouth and the Rhode Island Center for Freedom and Prosperity. Those aren't exactly communist organizations, so I can't figure out what the problem is. But there you have it. Senator John Pagliarini will be there, but Senate District 11 challenger Jim Seveney has stepped back. Similarly, Republican Ken Mendonca has accepted for his race for the House District 72 seat. Curiously, his opponent Linda Finn has stand clear, and this is an open seat. What is with all this boycotting when there are voters to be convinced of your leadership chops? Don't they want to be available for their potential constituents? Or is it that they don't want to be unless they can carefully control the message? Really? No. Really? Are you kidding me? I'm Mark Zakaria. This is Common Sense. Welcome back. We're here for our final segment with Gary Sass. And we're on the campus of Bryant University and we're talking about some of the things that the state of Rhode Island and its government could do to make life better. Let's talk a little bit, Gary, about some of the things that our viewers probably know about that have gone wrong and the potential solutions. Let's start, if I may, with truck tolls. Well, you know, truck tolls is a good way to put a sign on your border we're closed with business. Uh, the, the idea about the truck tolls is the governor and the legislature are 100% right. We needed to do more and invest in improving our road infrastructure. When I was director of administration, uh, I went to sleep every night worried that we wouldn't have a tragedy on the 610 connector. It, it is, you know, it, is, it needs to be you know, fixed. I don't think you need a 1950 solution to, to fix it. So the, there is a need to you know, make the investment. The question is, what is the most cost-effective and effect, ever efficient way to finance it? And I might just interject here, if I could, that the people looking in on this will say, well, wait a minute, what about the gas tax and what about the uh, up charges that we had at DMV and what about all the other dedicated streams that have been over the years diverted from, from uh, roads well, and bridges to the general fund and who's to say that's not going to happen again? Well, we're, we're playing catch up. Uh, for a long time, we didn't airmark the gasoline tax for transportation. You know, we have for several years now. Uh, and the same with some of the other transportation fees, licenses and registration fees. Part of the problem we have is, is, is playing catch up as I mentioned, and it came about because every time we wanted to undertake a, a transportation improvement project, we bonded it. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> the state match would come from bonding, the other 50 or 60 or 70, 80 percent would come from the feds. And so we became awash in debt because we didn't have a stream of revenue, which we should have had, to do more PAYGO to finance our roads. That's, that's, that's how we got here. And as a result, there was no money for maintenance because we were paying all our money to Wall Street. We were paying you know, debt service, so we couldn't maintain the roads and the roads and the bridges deteriorated. That's shortly how we got here. For the last seven or eight years, uh, since the Kachiri administration, you know, steps have been taken to fix it by dedicating gasoline taxes and other you know, revenues and increasing other revenues to transportation fund. But the, the, the shortfall or the gap in needs for infrastructure was so great. Uh, but there were other ways of doing it without towing. RIPEC uh, did a study, and their study you know, found that if you used uh, you know, more Garvey bonds, and Garvey bonds are borrowing in anticipation of receiving federal transportation. You, you're borrowing your future uh, federal aid to fix up current roads, and it worked. Well, we built the highway. That was a Garvey project, and everyone now recognizes it was smart because we got the economic benefit of that money up front in fixing, uh, you know, the building, building the highway. And, and so the RIPEC study suggested that we could do exactly what the governor felt we needed to do, you know, without, without tolls. Because what happens with tolling is between, for the next 10 years, uh, we use the tolls to fix the bridges, and then we get this huge uh, surplus of money, which no one knows how it's going to be used. So we didn't have to use you know, this, this method of funding. The other issue is about tolling, since it's tied just directly to trucks, is there are serious questions 
about the assumptions on which the revenue base is built, how many truck trips that come comes with the state. And there are big differences of opinion uh, between the uh, State Department of Transportation and the truckers as to how many trucks are actually going to use these roads. There's big uh, differences of opinion in doing the economic forecasting on what the diversions will be, how many trucks will get off the roads that, that are tolled. Uh, so there are a lot of unanswered questions about, about the tolls. Uh, you know, which uh, I guess we'll get one of these days. Before we move on from there, let's just finalize one thing. Did I hear you say that there is today a specified fund for infrastructure improvement for roads and bridges? Yes. And that money goes into it, and when the General Assembly tries to go into it, they get one of these. Well, the General Assembly has a lot of influence, you know, on what puts in the fund. But if you look at the of general revenues of the state, the gasoline tax is going to a dedicated fund, which wasn't the case for, for a long time in the state. Well, that's a step forward, and that's good to hear. Uh, let's move on, if we can, to post-employment benefits. Uh, many state employees uh, are in the MERS system, as you know, and uh, that's one of the problems we see about, you know, the percentage of funding and, and, and whatnot. Uh, there are questions of uh, whether or not elected officials are the right ones to make the best financial decisions and so forth. Mm -hmm. One of the questions I'd like to get to is, what do you think the practical reality is about somehow transitioning this into a defined contribution plan? Would make it more like a 401k. Well, as far as uh, you know, funding uh, post-employment benefits, the states really made a lot of progress. They they were slow in implementing it. In 2008, 2009, uh, they basically said that we're going to you know fund uh, our OPED benefits going forward on an actuarially sound basis, and we're going to amortize the past debt over the next 30 years. It took them three years to get there. They should, you know, it was recognized in 2008, 2009. In 2011, the state, uh, you know, s s stayed pretty religious uh, to am beginning to amortization of the, of the past debt and, and funding the current obligations on an actuarially sound basis. So, you know, that's 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 progress. Uh, they also, at that same time, uh, changed some of the uh, rules on eligibility, increased co-shares. So, you know, there were 60 years or 80 years of you know building up these these. Uh, uh, benefits the uh, you know the uh, the and um, they are put in place you know a program to begin to to address them and I I you know you can argue that it could be a little different here it could be a little bit different there but I think the critical point is that we are now more fiscally responsible in how we're trying to fund it going forward it's always great to hear that we're making progress but I guess what I'm hearing you say is there's very little chance that we'll see anything like a 401k where the individuals have any kind of responsibility over the funds dedicated to them because of the recent improvements and because the argument would be that we're already correcting the traditional system but with the pension system we have moved to a hybrid system where uh, you know employees now the state uh, contributes uh, into the pension part about 3.75 and then the employees, no, the employees contribute, I'm sorry, 375, and they put another 5% in, which effectively goes to a 401k, which a state matches with 1%. So <clears throat> you have to also be pragmatic when you have these kinds of costs. You know, we talked about the state structural deficit. Uh, you have to be realistic in how you can dig your way out of a hole. And I don't think it's any by, me, by any means perfect, but these issues are being considered and steps are, positive steps are being taken. One of the things that I always think when it comes to leadership is that leadership causes cultural changes. And yeah. Good leadership causes people to start thinking about doing things the way leadership is kind of urging. And uh, you obviously have to sell on benefits, you have to explain to the people why this new way is better than the old way. But that kind of leadership is something that I think is lagging a little bit even in light of some of these recent gains uh, you run the Leadership Institute. What do you think the uh, future holds for improving the leadership capability of Rhode Island elected officials? Well, there's a lot of work to be done. You know, a lot of these <coughs> reforms that I mentioned came about because of economic necessity. Mm -hmm. uh, they, the taxpayers, you know, couldn't afford to you know, pay that pension fund. Uh, our credit ratings would have been affected if we didn't deal with the OPEB, you know, kinds of problems. So there were economic factors, you know, driving it. There's a lot to be done to improve leadership. I look at a couple of things. I'm just going to move a little bit on the subject. You know, what the state's gone through in implementing the uh, so-called uh, Unified Health Information Program. Uh, <clears throat> way over budget. Uh, some of our most needy citizens are not being treated, you know, properly. And I don't hear anything coming from leaders of the state about accountability. Somebody's accountable. Somebody has to be held responsible. And that is a clear definition 
of not changing the leadership culture. It's kind of go along to get along, you know, business as, as usual. Uh, you know, that has to change. I look at the legislature and some of the, they, they, thank God they put a question on ethics reform on the ballot. They weren't going to put it on the ballot. It wasn't a question of leadership saying, well, we've got to do something better about ethics. It was a question about being embarrassed, mm. and they had no choice. So we've got to get away from a reactive posture about leadership. In closing, I guess what that says is that there's going to be plenty of work to do for the Hassenfeld Institute for uh, Public Leadership for uh, many years to come. Gary, we have to call it quits there. Thank, Thank you very, very much for taking time with us and with our, uh, with our uh, viewers. Folks, uh, stand by for Jeff Richard and his closing commentary for today's show, and thank you for watching. I received the Rhode Island Voter Information Handbook this week. It informs us as to what referenda will be on the 8 November ballot. There will be seven issues we can decide upon. The first two don't have a borrowing dimension. Gambling at Tiverton and putting the General Assembly back under the Ethics Commission. My vote will be yes to ethics and no to gambling. Three through seven are going to cost the taxpayers dearly. The bill for these will be 364 plus million bucks. This is on top of the current state debt of $18.9 billion. That was in 2014 numbers, so it probably is worse today. The handbook was quick to point out that the number is only an estimate that is based on 20-year loans at an interest rate of 5%. This suggests to me that for the next 20 or so years, the taxpayers will be spending money paying down debt instead of spending money on Rhode Island citizens. I should attempt, admit right now that I hardly ever vote for bonds. I look at them as the way government gets around a lack of fiscal planning. We push the problem out into the future so our kids inherit the responsibility for paying. Of course, by that time, most of the officials responsible for the lack of planning are retired in Florida. I would like to spend a few minutes looking at referenda 3 through 7. First, the veterans home. We voted in 2012 to bond 94 million for a new home. Seems the feds put in a sizable share of taxpayer money, leaving Rhode Island the need to borrow a mere 33.5 million. So they did. Now what's wrong? They screwed up. They are now claiming that we Rhode Islanders have to borrow another 27 million, which after 20 years at 5%, we'll have, we will have spent 43 plus million bucks. Why? Because inflation in materials and labor have gone up since 2012. Really? Like most government projects, the planning department didn't get it right, so they need more money. Nope. I say we take it out of the existing budget. No on three, please. The next travesty is headlined, Leveraging Higher Education to Create 21st Century Jobs Bonds. This one will cost us $72,937,126. Last cycle, in 2014, we voted a $125 million bond for URI to build a new engineering building. So now we will add some more debt by renovating another existing building for $25.5 million. Hmm. Good news for the construction unions, as all the work has to be done using prevailing wage laws. The other part of this bond is a dreamland project similar to the federal program the Obama administration wants to do. Rhode Island intends to let the Quasi-Governmental Commerce Corporation manage a program to hold a competition among various private partnerships to create innovation campuses. This is an attempt to let private companies get newly trained employees through taxpayer financing. Get real. Our governor is quoted as saying, this bond builds on our success and it positions us for greater, more sustainable success in the years ahead. By voting yes on four, you're going to be voting for a stronger economy. What nonsense. No on four, please. Next up, the port infrastructure. Total costs 112 plus million. Remember that Quonset is managed by the Quasi-Governmental Quonset Development Corporation. These 11 folks have a capital improvement program. That has 24 plus million dollars in it. Why didn't they think this new project through years ago and budget for it? No on five, please. The green economy bonds, number six, are a collection of dream projects that never made it into the regular budgeting process. The bad part about this grab bag is the handbook doesn't tell you who will manage all this money. I shudder when I see the words matching grants, particularly when local land acquisition is used in the same breath. No on six, please. Lastly, number seven gets us back to the sand pit of affordable housing. This round will be costing you 80 plus million over the next 20 years. 
The handbook doesn't tell you how much has been spent over the years for so-called affordable housing. It does say that, quote, funding from past affordable housing bonds has been used to create over 1,900 affordable houses and apartments for families, seniors, and veterans in 31 communities across the state. Hmm. So why do we keep bonding affordable housing instead of putting it into the state budget if it is so important? So if you vote yes on seven, you can expect that affordable housing bonds will build stuff on the land bond six purchased in your town and mine. No thanks. No on bonds. We should vote no. Maybe someone will get the message. Thank you for watching and God bless.